Hello. Hello, welcome once again to my program. And it's called Roy Masters is Talking About You. And I think in just a few moments, if you'll bear with us, you'll see that it will be just like reading your mail. Everybody has the same basic problem. There's no such thing as anybody who is different. You know, only egos like to think that we're different. Um, you know, everybody likes to think they're different, but that's what makes them all alike. Have you ever seen women, you know, looking, picking over a lot of earrings or cheap custom jewelry in the jewelry store and saying, what do you think of this, dear? Isn't it different? <laughs> you know, everybody wants to be different. They're all alike. They all want to be different. <laughs> it's all your problems. All your problems are exactly the same. And uh, the, the magic of, of solving problems is just to realize to the degree that all our problems are exactly alike. There's just variations, like evolution is supposed to be. I don't believe in evolution. There's no missing links between different species, like lizards and animals. Warm-blooded, there's no missing links. So I, they've never been able to find that, but like it's supposed to be. The, uh, like evolution's supposed to be, so are your problems, evolving out of something very tiny and very insignificantly small, unnoticeable, almost, oh, infinitesimal, you know, very tiny, like an acorn, like a seed, bless you. And, and, and it, the more it grows, the more it evolves the errant self. Now there's an errant self and there's an innocent self. Two natures can grow, depending upon how the consciousness or the soul chooses. Depending upon those choices, forces of life act on you. And you react to those forces of life. And depending on your, on, on your resistance to those forces, either the forces of life outside you, you, you flow into them and they flow into you and you become a person. Or if you resist those forces, if you know how to resist, to be resilient to them, so you don't take on the forces of all alike, see, then you become an ind a whole person, a complete person. But the, you, you can only grow to be the, the perfect and complete person if you have found a way to be different from everybody else. Not just trying to be different, but what makes everybody alike is that all, they all react to stress and take on the identity of the stress. For instance, let's say you're born in Borneo, so you become a cannibal. And then if you try to resist that, they probably eat you, so there aren't many holdouts over there. You know? But in a free society, you have a right to be different. But remember what I said about being different? You don't want to be different like the woman who says, oh, is this different, dear? You know, just appearances only. Ego difference. I talk about different meaning different from the sinfulness and the sickness of the world. There are very few people like that. It's, as a certain uh, psychiatrist wrote, he's, it's a, uh, a book called uh, A Path Less, Less Traveled. I forget his name, Scott Peck, his name was, I think. Uh, it is a road less traveled, hardly ever traveled. Narrow is the way, and few are those that find it. And this evening we're going to talk and hunt and peck and lift up stones and try to, to understand the secret of this pathway to being different in this truest, truest sense, this rarest way of being different. Okay? Now, I don't know where to start here this evening because I have said this evening is a free-for-all. You can, you can talk to me about anything you want. If it's dumb, I'll tell you to shut up. <laughs> Don't think I'm rude, I just haven't got time to mess around with the type of questions that reporters ask President Reagan. Sometimes they're so lengthy and so complicated and so intellectual, I don't think they know what they said themselves. I don't know how the hell he answers them, but he manages, some, somehow, manages somehow being polite. I'm not going to be that polite, because I'm not running for president. So anybody have, have, have a question they'd like to pose me, or even a subject matter? You had a few moments ago, didn't you? about the negative roles that men and women play with each other. And I'm wondering what the proper role of a woman should be, because she often seems to be the downfall of a man. Well, if you played the proper role, you would not be the downfall of a man, right? Yes. And the trouble is, no man would have anything to do with you. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. You understand that, don't yes. you? I mean, the very fact that you're proper is is like a um, like a uh, like you're like you're like poison. They don't want you proper. They want to draw out of you that which isn't good. Now, but that which isn't good to a man is good to a man. See, because it's it's what he's made of. So you, we're talking about the pride of men, aren't we? The animal pride, the selfishness of man, the earthiness. Well, that earthiness lives out of what is not proper in a woman. And uh, the, the woman that's not proper is very exciting to such a man. And the woman who is proper is not very exciting to a man, <laughs> see? So that's your problem. If you're going to be proper, there aren't many men that won't have anything to do with you. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Not if you, if you're proper, you're not lonely, yeah. because you are complete, mm -hmm. or you know that your completion is from within you, and it doesn't from a man or from anybody else. Mm -hmm. I think if you have found a proper man, he, as he is taught himself, as he discovers for himself the way, he will teach you the way. He will lead you back to being whole from within you, uh, being a person that doesn't sort of flow from him because he's not a person that flows from you. See, so you don't flow into, in and out of him, and he doesn't flow in and out of you as a way of developing this identity. The identity is within and complete. And to the degree that somebody loves you, to that degree, they won't, won't flow into you. And, and they won't let you flow into them. They won't, won't let you bond. I won't let my children bond. I'm not very affectionate to my children. Well, not since they were four or three or four, two or three. Once they got to three or four, I didn't need to be affectionate because, well, like Joshua, my grandson, says when his mother wants to be affectionate to him, he says, give it to Jennifer. She needs it more. <laughs> <laughs> she needs that love. <laughs> See? I remember my mother used to want to dance with me when we go to a wedding. I felt terribly embarrassed, but she felt, oh, she felt this is my son <laughs> flowing into him. And be, see what I mean? She felt very proud, and I felt like yucky, that something she wanted to take something from me. Gentlemen, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And I tell you, the person who is going on the path less traveled uh, is very aloof. Not ice cold. It would seem from, from people who can use your, uh, your imperfection to, to, to draw from, that you're a person that is not any use to them. They can't use you, because you're not a person to use others, so therefore you can only use a person who uses you. You can only flow into a person who flowing into you, <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> you, see, you can only get into a person who is somehow into you, and you often make that opportunity uh, available, like women have this, make this opportunity of men to flow into them and to get into the woman, but she gets into him. You know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy once that happens. That's an identity problem. So men have identity in women, and, the, and once the woman's identity is into the man, then it is impossible for a man to be anything but what the, what the woman is. He's made of what the woman it, in other words, it's corruption. Pride, the pride of life, the identity that comes from the world around us, the appeal, the glorifying appeal, like a woman is a glorifying appeal. Oh, I'll make you a million dollars as a, a glorifying appeal. I'll make you a film star as a glorifying appeal. Someone loving you and giving you all the approval. Someone giving you a gift is a glory. Once you start to come down to that love, to that flow, that offering, once you start to bite that, you can't let go of it. You can't be anything more than your involvement with the object. More involvement with the object, if you see what I mean. And that's the man-woman relationship, yes. You made that sound kind of final, that uh, once the spirit of woman got into man, that you made it sound like it was almost irreversible, but it, I don't believe that. No, I didn't, didn't mean to imply that it's in, irreversible, but you can't reverse it. No, I can't remember. No, you can't. In other words, you, you are the product of your environment. Just like the, dr the dope addict 
is a product of the dope pusher. And he cannot be any more than what the pusher makes him. And what he makes the pusher, what, what power he gives to the pusher to make him. It's like men give, men give women power to give them illusions of grandeur, give them a sense of who they are. They give men, they give the women that power. So does the dope addict give the power to the pusher to see. Once you recognize this in yourself, though, isn't that the, the first step in the right direction? Yes, but what is it in a person? There's a lot of people listening to this program right now who um, have the foggiest idea what we're talking about. There's no other dimension. For, for, there's, nothing, there's nothing more than, than the, the creation of the creator. See, there's the creation of the creator, the inner man, directly inbreathed from, from God that holds man apart from life, that can hold him up and make him aware that there's something wrong with the way he exists. But the great majority of human beings, if you can call them that, actually are not really human beings. They only appear to be on the surface. They're so much the creatures of the creation, the beast. There's so much the reflection of that which lurks in the environment, sort of hovers in the environment. So full of that are they that they're very, they're, they're very, the very infrastructure is tremendously threatened by us even talking about this. So if you're capable of hearing what I'm saying, it's because you are chosen. Not everybody is able to hear the truth because, and I don't know the mystery of it. I don't know why I would, you or me would be able to hear what I'm saying enough to be able to go to where I'm coming from and to grow from where I'm coming from, like I'm growing from where I'm coming from. See, I don't know what the mystery is, but some, there was an article in the paper um, this evening someone gave me, he said there's, there's a certain type of child, about one in 10, that no matter what environment they've come from, the horrors of, of brutality and alcoholism and rape and violence, somehow they're resilient to all the stresses. They slow to anger and quick to recover. That nothing seems to touch them. Like Oliver Twist, remember the story of Oliver Twist? No matter what he went through, such a beautiful story. Everybody else was violated and corrupted and they became thieves and low-life types of human beings, but little Oliver Twist kept his dignity throughout it all, so finally he could be recognized by who his parents and who his relatives really were. It's a lovely story. And, and, and it's the same with you, ladies and gentlemen. There's something in you that holds you, hold you apart to some degree, of course you are involved with them, and them are in you, and you are part of them. And that's the reason why you have conflict, but you have conflict and they don't. They don't have the kind of conflict you do. And therefore, they don't have the ultimate possibility of resolution like you do. See? So you become the, uh, the, the perfect person. They I become... The, uh? I read the Adam and Eve syndrome. Yeah. And you know, it was very threatening to my ego. Of course it is. Uh, <laughs> You're talking about this book painful. here, right? I was talking about yeah. that book. It was very painful, you know, but I, I sit through it, I read through it, and I learned something from it. What did you learn? Just that what we were talking about. That I man? learned that, that uh, the spirit of woman in me control me for, for a lot of years. And it brings you back to woman and for the source of your life, doesn't it? That's right. The renewing of your life. I'm starting to overcome that, though. Oh, how so? I don't know. You don't know, huh? I don't know. You never. <clears throat> first of all, you have to realize it. Right. Just then the realization leads to overcoming. Now, the gentleman over there. I was going to say, like, part of that, you said it's not a one-way street, and he doesn't make it sound like it. You have to move out of the way because you're in the line of... Go ahead. You're talking about how you get sucked in sometimes because people offer a little too much. It's like you get seduced in. You take, you take up the offer that's given to you. That's like I was going to say, part of the way out of it is um, when you start just doing what's fair, that's like, that has the effect of keeping people at a distance sometimes. It's but like, how, how does a person know what's fair? You know. You do know. You know when someone's offering you a little more than they should. And even as you take them up on it, it's like you have to make something quiet in you because you do know. Yes. And as you stop to do that and you just start saying, well, 
No, you care about what's fair more than that. Yeah, well, it's a little confusing when, when I hear it from you, but I'll have to make it simple if you don't mind. You said that you've got to be very careful even of someone giving you a flower at the airport. That tiny little flower? It, well, who was it said, was it Shakespeare, be, beware of Greeks bearing gifts? <laughs> it's not only Greeks. You've got to be very, very careful of something offered to you that's more than it should be. Sure, but they'll even look at your fairness as a type of coldness, as if, if it was a sort of reproof, like I've had that before. Yeah, you and it's take, not, you're just trying to do what you feel is fair, and it's like they treat you you're as if you're too, coming you're, across what as What you're doing is you're them. going too far ahead of these people here. You're, you're, all in your, you're all by yourself right now when you're talking. You're going to try to involve everybody. But that's, he said it's not a one-way street, though, and that's, that's the way back, because as you come back to seeing what's fair and just doing that, that's how all that's in you that shouldn't be there, it but starts you see, to like... You see, the flower at the airport, coming back to that, that free gift, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no th th such thing as free love. There's no such thing as free marijuana and cigarette. Because the, the offering that is, see, only a, you have to understand it from an ego point of view. Only an ego, a king, has tribute. And some people, and, and See, in the fallen state, you do not know how to receive a gift without feeling honored. Even the flower at the airport. Who understands that? You're giving up the gift, and you never see what you give up. When you come down to get that gift, that little tiny little bit, that's why you, I often wondered, why, you know, do people go to a used car lot and say, you know, we're going to give you this 35 millimeter camera, and it probably cost them $2 a piece, you know, a nothing thing. But people will come in there and to, 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 to a test drive a car for, in the hope of getting a 30, and they know very well that once, once the salesman gets them, once they come in for that free gift, once you accept that little flower at the airport, they can sell you that, that little bugger bagita, whatever it is they sell you, right? Uh, Hare Krishna, whatever it is they sell. You, you, out comes your pocket, you, 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 you pay 10 bucks for that flower. You, 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 once, once you give something, you've got to go on get it, giving to get it. Once a woman gives you love, you've got to be so careful of that free love, that wink, that uh, someone bowing and scraping and wanting to do something for you. Sure. Once you see what you're giving up, honoring that even, ego. It's not even attractive anymore. Well, like, we, we, like yeah, but you see, that's the trouble is, you, you, how many people know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced it? You can't say no to people. I remember when I noticed that I have a very f good friend of mine who is a multi-multi-millionaire. And many, many years ago, he used to travel around with me. And he's still, we're still very good friends to this day. And uh, I don't know, I was looking in the store window. I could do a lot of writing. I just think, well, it's a nice gold pencil. It's, you know, gold plated. But I normally write with a just cheap pencil. He said, I'll get that for you. Well, I didn't think anything of it. That was nice of him. He wanted to do something nice for me. But after I'd received it, never thought anything of it. He made a little demand on me later on, and all of a sudden I found I couldn't refuse. How many people have noticed that? <laughs> now, gentlemen, um, there are much more powerful things than a gold pencil. <laughs> uh, no, no, but it wasn't really demand. It was, it, I don't remember how it came about. But he was, he, he still is a certain, he has a certain amount of willfulness in him. If I offer someone something, I don't want anything. I know. Sure. The trouble is, the trouble is, I wasn't mature enough at that point. That's how I learned about it. So later on, we, we went into, we bought a boat together. And again, he wanted to, because after all, I didn't have very much money. It all, was all in the foundation I was beginning. So he wanted to be nice, he really did. So he said, look, let me, it was a $2,400 boat, it was a Chinese junk. He's probably watching the show right now. I said, no, I said, no, Mark, that's his name. I said, I'm going to pay my half and you pay your, your half. And he's given money to the foundation quite a bit since then. But, uh, you know, mostly he, I don't know about it when he does it. It's better that way. It doesn't obligate me, see, to, to make him, make, make me look. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's much better to give. If you're going to give someone, don't let it be known who, it's, who it is for those reasons, see? 
And besides, um, I don't know how we're getting into the subject of giving, but it's, it is a wonderful subject. Anybody else? You were born giver? Oh, <laughs> well, we'll we'll have to take your question. Go ahead. Can we do it? I was a born giver. I mean, and everything I gave, then I would judge the person after I gave it. Now, why would you judge <laughs> the person? See, I, I I have to stop for a minute when I hear that because I I'm almost sure I know what you're talking about it. But see, I've never had that problem. My, my errant self never grew to those proportions where I start thinking on that level. I'm sure there are levels of thinking yeah. and levels of confusion which I've never experienced. But let's hear yours. You judge the person? Because they would receive and not give me in return. <coughs> and, but the point is you gave them to make but the, me but feel the motive better. for giving, then you'll see the motive of, 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 give, of sure. giving was to see if you could obligate them after sure. the manner I just described. Yeah. That you weren't good enough. No, that I couldn't know. No, and then you, that would get you, in me, and I'd hate that. Then I'd go find somebody else and give to. You felt? Same you, answer, same, you know, situation that I'd hate them. Then what would have happened if they did give you something back, what you wanted? I wouldn't know how to receive it. I didn't know how to receive anything. This gentleman here wants to say something here. <laughs> well, I just said she, she wasn't given at all because of her expectations. That's right. And uh, this whole subject, uh, I think, comes from a man's basic need that he's, <clears throat> we're born into the world separated from God and we feel incomplete. <clears throat> well, but why are we born? What has it that's... The question well, is, what has it that separated us from... call it original sin or whatever. Right, it has to be that. And we try to get our ego fed <clears throat> so many different ways from other people, situations. And uh, if a man is complete, then there's nothing that can be given him to feed his fry pride to make him feel more complete. But then, if he is complete... If can he has he... a relationship with God. That's right, but if he is then complete, can he then receive without being seduced. Sure, he can. He can. See, he, he, there's a lady back there that wants to... Yeah. Uh, I uh, had an experience, this, this was some time ago, and this is on the subject of giving. Uh, an elderly man came to our house uh, looking for work. And uh, this was before I was married. And uh, my father you know, we needed some washing walls and, and a little bit of light work, not too heavy for him, because he was in his 70s. And we noticed as the days passed, and he would do, you know, continued his work for us, he uh, would bring p pickles and peanut butter for lunch. And that's all he would eat. So I had my lunch every day at a certain time, because I was working for my father. I was a secretary, and I'd sit down from 1 o'clock, and I'd eat my lunch. And knowing that this is all he had to eat, I would make him lunch and ask him to sit down uh, and join me. Well, then you me. started to spoil him, didn't you? And uh, I, <laughs> he had no wife. He says that I reminded him of his wife. She, he, uh, some many years ago, he, she had died in a hospital uh, when she was very young, when they were well, first can you married. Can come to the point, because we only have a few minutes yeah, left. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap that up. Anyway, um, when he finished his work, I had, he called me one day, and he said he was sick. And uh, uh, he kept mentioning my father had gone to see him. He lived in a kind of very remote area, and he had mentioned to me, he said, I don't want you to ever go over there. It's very dark and desolate. He lives by himself in this old shack, and it's, you know, it's no place for a woman to go. Because he remembered that bottom the... Bottom line, the bottom line, we're, almost, the off the, kept, we're almost off the air. Okay, that the man kept uh, uh, wanting me to come over there because I reminded him of his wife. Well, anyway, he said he was very sick. I said to him, I said, well, from what, did it, what did the symptoms he described, he says that uh, uh, he we're, was we're bleeding running or something. Out of time. And I said, <laughs> running out of time, but, uh, bottom line. Anyway, the bottom I line. felt that uh, maybe I could have done more to help him. He was sick, and I offered to call an ambulance no, you made to no take point. him to a doctor. <laughs> you made no point. All you did and, was, no, you made no point. Well, how far should you go? and helping somebody when you've gone far enough when they are starting to draw off of you i don't know it's not it's not a good point it's not a good story and it would well, we'll have to, to, we'll, I got to 
it's, I think it's a good point. I what mean, I don't know. To, um, know. to help people before um, you can feel them drawing my, on you. Well, see, when people make you feel sorry for them, if a beggar stops you on the street, uh, they're very good at making you feel sorry for them because people, egos, love to be elevated by something inferior, more pathetic than themselves. Women love to have a pathetic man to feel sorry for because they feel so superior in working hard and, and taking care of them and, and making him weaker and weaker for the sake of that, for, to call upon her industri industriousness. Anyway, I haven't got time to finish off the thought, but we can finish it off in the next program because we're beginning to start something very interesting. Agreed? So let's keep this thing going, going for the next uh, segment. Meanwhile, I hope you've enjoyed our program. Um, we hope it'll be more lively the next evening. But uh, write to the foundation for the cassettes that teach you how to meditate and become objective so you understand how to control your own life so the pressures of life don't control you and weaken you. Thanks for listening and join us again in the next program tomorrow evening. Hello, I'm Roy Masters and we are discussing the human ego, the human condition and all the problems that unroll from it and how we can overcome this evolution of error between one another, me reacting to you, you reacting to me, I get upset with you, you get upset with me, I get upset with your upset, you get upset with us, I'm upset. We presume we're killing each other, driving each other nuts. This is what we're discussing. And, and the, the problems of man's relationship with man and woman have little turnings, little, like for instance, we, last evening we were talking about, or the last session, we were talking about giving and receiving. That's a problem for people, to know how to give, to know how to be kind. Sometimes we, we can't give at all because we've been, our, our experience is we've been hurt by those we've given to. Some people in our lives have actually manipulated us to give. Or we've man manipulated others to give us because we've made them feel sorry for us. And having made them feel sorry for us, we find an easy way of getting things without having to work just becoming pathetic. See? <laughs> so therefore those who, give it, those who give to us, we have contempt for. Because even one, though, in one, one sense we like it. We feel smug and superior, clever. And on the other hand, we discover that we're no longer dependent on ourselves. That we're really dependent on manipulating. And we can't get anything for ourselves except we sort of take it from others. And that, so therefore we tend to blame those other people that we've manipulated to give us for being so weak and not seeing what we really need. Someone to say, no, I'm not going to give you a thing. Go get it for yourself. But then the liberals would cry out, but that's cruel. See? And you see a whole society of welfare recipients being given things and then robbed of their identity. And so, of course, there's a whole panorama of problems without me. I don't have to say really much more than that. You can see what problems we have in our society from parents spoiling children, government spoiling um, the, the population, and the angers and the hatreds of, on both sides. While the, the, those who receive it are, are dependent and, and, and resentful because they, can't, they don't have, they're locked into that lifestyle without being able to grow and evolve from their own roots having been robbed by the kindliness of the liberal politicians, the liberal conservatives, you know, liberal with your money, conservative with their own. Right? So you see, we've been talking about, you still want to talk about that? Because there's kindness, and then there's guilt, and then there's fear, and then there's resentment, and then there's judgment. There's all kinds of little, little, um, pinpoint frames of reference that le lead back to or grow from the original problem we have. See, and so that's what we're going to, so we're, this evening we're on a roll, I think, on, on, on giving. I don't mind if you want to change the subject and go from one thing to another. Yes, that lady back there.
Why is it that when you uh, when you receive a gift from someone, sometimes you feel awkward? Like if you if you don't like feel you've it. earned it, then you feel awkward about receiving it. I I'm guilty of that. I have to tell you, I have a ranch in Oregon where I was too kind to people that came in out of the rain, out of the out of the cities, and I didn't let them work as hard as they should. And they became smug, spoiled, um, comfortable, dependent, and didn't grow. My daughter has a wildlife park. She does the same thing. She, um, out of an agreement with a certain person who lent her some money, agreed to take girls in and, and shelter them and teach them a trade and give them money, you know, let them earn a, earn a salary and uh, use their time properly save their money, but she works their tails off. She works them hard and doesn't pay them much to begin with, but they turn out better. When you pay a person too much, I've had a person here who was on drugs. He actually worked for me, very intelligent fellow, 50 bucks an hour he used to earn, some super electronic technician technocrat. And uh, while well, he was on cocaine, well, he, he felt guilty for receiving 50 bucks an hour. Besides, he could do the work in half the time anyway and sit around feeling guilty for not... He was being paid too much. Um, but any time I want someone... If, if the mafia does that, or big business, they will take a person of very ordinary persuasion and they'll pay them $200,000 a year and seduce them into the soft life. Once you get that feeling of being a king, you'll kill for it, to hold on to it. You see that? But why do you feel awkward? Why do you feel awkward? when people give you things? Mm -hmm. Because mostly it's not given in the right spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. One. Two, you don't know how to receive it in the right spirit. For instance, I have people giving me things. I, ne I don't get many personal gifts. That's, that's, uh, that's the truth. I, I, I make it a point of uh, reminding people, letting people know I'm not interested in a personal relationship with anyone. Mm -hmm. If they want to give, I'd rather not know you gave it just give it to the foundation, thank you very much, and I don't want to know who you are. And it's better that you don't know that I... I mean, some people try to let, you know, put money in my hand to let them know who gave it, because they want a certain amount of honor, see, from that, and I don't give honor. I'm not a respecter of persons, and, and, and it's because those people especially shouldn't be receiving that, that smile, because they're giving for the wrong reason. They're giving to get a reaction from me, an appreciation from me. It's not healthy. but. Um, People who have occasionally given me things um, uh, with an ulterior motive, um, I've been able to learn how to deal with that. Because, for example, let's take, go back to the flower at the airport, the little flower that the Hare Krishnas give you. Well, if they're going to give you a flower, how do you handle that? Because you know that you, they're going to hit you up for some bucks, right? To sell you something. So the first thing I'll say is, do I owe you anything for this? Do I have to buy anything? before you give it to me. Oh, no, not at all. But they're lying, aren't they? So I said, if that case, you can put it on. She said, now they start talking to me about this book. I said, OK, but you remember what I said? You gave me the flower, and I wasn't obligated. Now, if I say no to you, how will you feel? Well, she said, you don't have to. You don't have to. But they keep on pushing. I said, you're pushing. Mm -hmm. I said, you really want me to buy that book, don't you? And you really resent me if I don't buy it. Because you lied just now. You really, you lied. <laughs> see? And this, see, you must put it right back on. That's one way. So when people give you a gift, make sure that if you send something fishy, say to them something like that, politely, uh, this is very nice. Thank you very much. I, I'm, am I obligated to give you anything for this? <laughs> now, they can lie and say, oh, no, but they really mean yes but finish with it. Now, six weeks later, they come to come to get that favor that, you know, you owe them. In their mind, you owe them. They're not honest. And you say, no, I, I can't do that. You might want to do it if it is natural for you to do it, if it's not out of your way and you don't mind. But when you start to feel the pressure, so do you remember what you said? You gave me that gift the other day? Is, am, am, am I, is this a payback? Am I obligated? Oh, no, not at all. But they really mean, don't mean that at all. They really mean it. 
Do you understand that? And you, can, you, people, you show people, you start to throw people back on themselves and show them what their motive is. And they can be very resentful and very angry with you. Mm. See? And then you could also find out of that, that out of their anger, they try harder to be nice to you. They can literally become your slave. Because they didn't get you once, they'll try again. They try to prove to you that they didn't give you anything to get something for you. They try to prove it to you. Because now, but you're not having that either. <laughs> and you find that everything starts to go well for you in life because people will start being nice to you and you don't even know why. <laughs> yes, <laughs> who understood what I just said? Question about uh, your mother asked you to dance at uh, four or five years old. Oh, no, that was when I was much older. Oh, I thought when you I said... When I was 16, no, no. Oh, I thought, well, let's say, well, let's take an age. I thought you said four or five. Let's say it's 16 and you danced with her or you played a game of checkers with her that's not your mother doesn't love you or sure love or I, don't that, she just, I don't know what you're saying is she showing too much love you said your mother shouldn't show too much love to uh or you shouldn't no, have we were too much talking love. about see this is sort of a little bit little bit uh, belated so there's yeah. a lot of pieces missing for most of the audience oh, I see. we were talking about um affection affection and mothers like to shower their sons with affection and it's the duty of fathers to separate them from their... See, fathers should be more dispassionate, especially as they grow older, as men get wiser. They should become more dispassionate. They should love their wives, but almost love them like their children. Now, the women livers will hate every word I'm saying. But if, 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 a, if, if a woman, if a man doesn't li love her, his wife like his son, like his daughter, the woman's going to love the man like a son and keep him a little child through her emotional support and her, and her passion. And that's the, the embarrassment you feel when your mother asks you to dance in a, in, a, in a wedding or something. If you're not centered in yourself to know how to deal with the pride that mother has in her son and the feelings that flow, the warmth and the feelings that she gets from that. This is my son. See, the feeling that mother... Who knows what I'm talking about? You do? See, so, so I think you missed the point that I was making, that men, as they men to really be a man is uh, dispassionate. Now, that doesn't mean to say a man has no emotion. This is probably coming back to our questions, uh, a subject of man and woman again. That doesn't mean to say a man does not feel anything, but he, doesn't, he learns not to feel from the woman's presence. A woman likes to make a man feel from her presence because then she becomes the center of his being. Because then he starts to exist from that. And this is what's embarrassing to a child, when a young man, when he, with his mother, wants to dance with her and, you know, she, there's a certain embarrassment. And it's, well, you're either bought into it, you've either bought into it and you're not, you're, not, you're a Neanderthal and you don't understand what's going on, or you're in, totally in control of yourself. You're beyond it, and you're gracious with your mother. In other words, you, you, you're, not, you're, not buying the, you're not playing the game, you're beyond it. As for example, let me give you an example. Let somebody meet you at the airport. Hello, I haven't seen you for such a long time. They put, they put their arms around you. They make such a big display, hoping for you to interact because they feed off of that. So what you, you've got to be very mature. After, how to deal with it. So you, 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 it's, it, the, the only reaction to that is either to be, react with the same kind of greeting, emotions, and you, then you are bonded to each other right away, and you g give that person the feeling they want, which isn't good. Or you have to reject them, which you can't do, and still be friends. It's a very delicate moment of learning to be gracious. Hello, nice to see you. A smile, a French, but no no reciprocal emotion, because otherwise you lose control. Anything that can make you feel, anything can emote feelings, see, takes, takes you away from yourself. The love of God has nothing to do with the emotional feelings, the, inter the interpersonal emotional feelings that people have with each other. It's transcendent to that. Yes. yes yeah, yeah. Uh, I was... Um relating to what you were saying about love and uh, for a long time since I was very young I've 
uh, kind of lost the love of my father. How many have ever had love of a father? Well, you see, the thing is that uh, there was something that was going on. You know, like, you know, when you're little, you might say, you know, ooh, look, got good big muscles, you know, and you, you have this kind of bond with your father, and I, I think it's more that maybe I lost the respect of him through something that he was doing. How many people here had any respect for their father anyway? If you, you wouldn't be here if you had respect for your father, to tell you the truth. I'm sorry to say that, but you wouldn't be searching. If you had a father that you really loved, who was truly lovable, who loved you in this dispassionate way, and always guided you to love, not with love, that is the greatest love of all. You guide a person to love which is not the emotional involvement with the, the lover. You, the, where, where is love? The love, my, my love is, I'm caught up in me. My God, I'm infilled. He is in me and I am in Him. And nobody can get in the way. Now, I love now. I'm, my bond, I've, I'm internally bonded and complete. I need nobody for my completion. I need you to support the foundation, but I don't need you for my completion as a whole person. Don't you see that? Isn't that what you like about me? I don't prey on you. I don't, you don't find any pressure at the foundation, do you? You want to give something, you give it out of the goodness of your heart. That's sweet for you too, isn't it? And it's sweet for me. If, if you give because you give, it's not because I've motivated you or because, because you're addicted to my approval, like some churches. See? I haven't, I haven't pumped you up and made you miss me when the pump isn't there. See? It's because I'm, I love you, not because of the mushy love that is feminine. Ladies, forgive me for saying that. I don't mean... That's important for little children, that warmth and love for children, but mother, fathers have to save children from that. <laughs> you see? But first of all, they have to save themselves from that. I have to let my sons go through their, that earth love first. They have to have a woman see I got to guide them to make sure they got one that's not too strong for them see there's certain certain rules and regulations about making sure that you you know that you're the master of the situation even though she's got you to some degree <laughs> that you still have that sort of strength in you to eventually pull out of it and beyond it so that you can be a kind of father that you need to be with your children am I did I did I get away from the subject a little bit well sort of um, you see, my father had a, a perversion. A perversion? And, yes. Um, to the to the female form, and uh, well, all men, all that's that's why you can't. That's why oh, women yeah, can't but, respect men, yeah, and, but and he children can't. He did something can't. to my sister. Pardon? He did something to my sister. Shocking. I know. And uh, well, then how could you love him? I know, but it, it, there's something that I just got to deal with with that. I know, but what you're saying is you. I don't know what it is. It, it, whatever love you have can't be, unless you're a very noble being and transcended what ordinary love means, the kind of thing that he did to his sister and the kind of thing that men do their, to their women. Mm -hmm. Unless you transcended it, then you can love. Uh, for instance, you know, I can love my wife, but I, I love her not like men love women. See, not anymore. I don't love her like men. I love her like a father loves a daughter. I correct her, and believe me, she needs it. If I treated her any other way, she, uh, I, I would, I, I would, it wouldn't exist. But women ultimately need that anyway. That the Adam and Eve, you know, when Adam, if you read the scripture, you will read that you know Adam was, was perfect. He was created to be imperishable, self-contained. So was Eve. And a man, as a matter of fact. Uh, um, it is this relationship with the Father, Adam's relationship with the Father, which is, is called wholeness and completeness. But the, the, woman's, the, man, the, the woman was out of man. Technically, she was his clone. And in scientific language, we know what cloning is. It's a non-sexual reproduction. So in a matter of sense, what the book is saying is that Eve was a clone, a reflection of man. See, and she was technically not his wife, but his, his child. But when the fall of man came, and man fell away from the spiritual father, from his wholeness, 
and the spirit of the woman displaced that, then she, he became her child. See? And ever since that time, women mother the egos of men, sexually, because that, get, that, that pops up, you see, if you pardon the way I said that. See, because the, the, the fall of man is, is, is his dying, and he becomes then a, a creature that perpetuates, perpetuates itself instead of being imperishable, everlasting to everlasting, perfectly, re self-renewing, because the God, is, the God is the self that renews. You follow that? So that when man falls from that and dis has become displaced by the spirit of the woman he failed to love, like a daughter, now he becomes, he becomes now her child. And you see, to this very day, that m men mother women. But very rarely have you ever seen a, a man father a woman. Every woman is looking for the father that she's never known. But every man is gravitates to the, to the woman he's always known. You see that? It's, in other words, he's imprinted with a woman and he's drawn back to the woman just like his mother. So his wife, which then becomes his wife, having had a woman that mothered him and kept him from God to be a male child, is actually a man's having sex with his mother when he's having sex with his wife. That's all there is to it. A, wo a, ma a woman literally sexually mothers maternally. It's almost a maternal thing for a woman to have sex with a man, and, a man I and, and the man, while he's involving himself sexually with his, this mother, is actually being his ego, the, 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 the child of this woman is being nurtured. The spiritual part of him is being nurtured. Well, but, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's hard to say it. See, in other words, the sexual impulse of the woman, because of the man falling from, from the perfection, out, out comes the, the evidence of his failing with, sec with his sexuality. So now, man is now a male. And, and the mother of this creature is the woman who has teased him and brought this out of him and created this need for her to nurture, but she nurtures it. She rises to the occasion of nurturing this pain that he has, this tension, this lust, which is connected psychically. It's an egotistical quality. It's, they're connected, you see. She nurtures that, and as she has sex with him, she's actually nurturing the ego through the sexual experience. She's actually mothering this, this creature into existence like she was God. So he gets his wholeness, his internal wholeness from this experience. Do the ladies know that? Yes? Um, is it the, the spirit of woman now that, that nurtures a child with, with love? It's and the they, same love. They, they the appeal to the, to the emotion, you know, of the child. Right. And then they use it against the child later on in years. Yes. And see, everybody that's uses it against everybody in life. That's exactly right. It's transferred, you see, this emotional bond. That's why I'm saying the bond of man should be eventually to his creator. But the, the, but the womanizer, the presence of a woman the day a child is born, when a woman holds that child to her bosom and loves this child, what she's doing, if especially it's a male child, she's just, she's just by this warmth and this supportiveness, is nurturing the, uh, the brainchild of her, Im of her own image. M man made over in the image of a female spirit. See? And and of course, man has already experienced some of this in relationship to his woman anyway, for which reason he has already trouble with her, had to beginning to make demands, controlling. He feels the bond, the emotional connection to his brain, to which his ego is attached. But, but his ego cannot grow without that emotional reinforcement, can it? See, which means more bonding to the woman and more ability for her to make demands on him. So pretty soon he becomes impotent in being able to correct her because he's not out of God, he's out of the woman. You can't stand up to God when it's the woman, you see? So, um, so now the, ch the woman has the same relationship with her children because man, having used her for his own ego building and having degenerated like an addict in need, is now impotent to correct that situation because he's not from God, he's out of woman. And what is out of a woman can't correct a woman. But what is in a woman needs that correction and she longs for a man to be a man and not neither. 
And what part of her longs for the man to need her because her own power structure is based on it. It's a false security, but that's the only security she has. She would be better off with the security of having a man who didn't need her. See? Who, who could guide her back to being not a parasite, but a whole person from within herself. But the trouble is men have pressured men, women, to play this role. But women don't seem to want to be corrected, as I see it in life today. They <laughs> resist it horribly. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not the woman. It's not the woman that wants to be that doesn't want to be corrected. Not all women want to be. No, no, you understand. Oh, that's better. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not the woman. It's not the woman that doesn't want to be corrected. It's what the woman is held captive by. You see, don't you understand? You have a spirit in the garden, paradise. There was something in the garden we call the serpent. See, it's a it's a it's a nature that got into the woman, that got into the man. So not only can a man not correct a woman. But um, he doesn't want to because he, his ego, which came from it, needs that woman to be that way. It's very difficult for a man. Besides, there are women that do want to be corrected. They don't like their own power. They don't like being the mother of this man and turning him into whatever it is, a beast or a wimp. They know that. They sense that, but they can't tell anybody. They can't tell the man. They can't make, it, make him into the kind of man that, that, that they need to save her. They don't know how to do that. So they have terrible frustration. But they really want a man to be not to need. Well, we're going to continue on with this thought um, tomorrow in, in our next segment. It will be tomorrow night for the viewers. You'll find all this information in the Adam and Eve syndrome, and uh, it's ten dollars if you're interested. And there's a new book coming out soon called "Falling from Love" with the in crossed out, fr "Falling from Love." It's really an old book, but we just uh, put some more chapters with it and revised it. But what we have to do is remedy the falling part and try to unite you back to your original selves. You know, the woman with herself and man with himself, which is the same God. And to that end, please take note of the uh, little commercial at the end of our program and write to us and we'll be happy to supply these tapes and cassettes and books to serve that purpose. Thanks for listening and supporting the program. The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears, and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Hello, welcome once again to the program. My name is Roy Masters and we are talking, we've been talking about the man-woman relationship. We can hardly escape it. I can't get away from it. You know, and I think, you know what I think? I think uh, that uh, this man Jesus came to save us from this, to save us from this fate worse than death, to save us from man-woman relationships. But, you know, to help us to enter into a God-man relationship. Because there is no man-woman relationship except there be a God-man relationship, whatever that means. That man's love should be for God. Well, what is this love for God anyway, but it's a yearning to be infilled? Would you agree? How can a person love? I mean, honestly, can anybody love? I mean, can anybody really give something that's valuable with loving? Because if you do, that vital thing which comes from a person would make that person your God. And then you become addicted. You become very mortified. You see? In other words, I, the only love that a man can have first is an emptiness. That's what love is. Love isn't. Love isn't anything but an emptiness crying out to be filled. Now, that is very sobering. Love is an emptiness. Now, 
there's two types of emptiness. It's two, it's a, two, part, two, of, two of us that can be crying out to be fulfilled. The true self and the false self. And the false self is that ego self that's come from a woman. So when that comes, when we get violated, when pride enters through the, through the love of a woman, man fell from love, didn't he? Original sin, man falling from love, in love, Immediately, the self that cries is outer. And we always cry out to that which has seduced us from our first estate. And that happens to be the woman. She's got one, up, she got one upsmanship or one downsmanship. See? And that problem between man and woman and man and God has existed ever since. And it's as original with us today as original sin. That's why men do not know how to love women, because they do not know how to love God first. They do not know how to love their children, because they're too busy being loved, stuffing themselves with a woman. Pardon the vernacular. See? They're stuffing themselves from what's coming from a woman, what appears to be coming from a woman, to sustain this, to answer to this need. And that's from hell. It is, it, yet, yeah, gentlemen, haven't you noticed? that being in love is a living hell? <laughs> okay, all right, now we, with that, we can take. I have a problem relating to my wife. This is my wife. Ah. Okay, we're asking the question together, but I don't know how to deal with her when she's right. I mean, it's like she is a pretty smart person, and sometimes she'll catch things she's smarter that I don't than you, catch, eh? so she wants to, well, sometimes. But I'm she more wants, willful. She wants to, to point out something to me, yeah. and she's right, and it's a problem. It's more of a problem when she's well, why right. why is a problem? Because, because I get if too excited, and, I, and I, it's like a little kid that comes to, his, comes to their mother and say, look what I've done, look what I've done, look what I've done. You stop being pushy. Well, well, it's getting better. I'm getting better, but there are times because there's still enough of his mother left with him, in him that when I tell him something or I say that I see don't something... Take, don't, then don't take over this floor. Let's listen to your husband first. Okay, okay. The quiet woman. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to take over the whole... I can see she wants to take the over. The problem her. is is that when she's right, but she's willful, yes. if I disagree with her, then I have to do the wrong thing because she's right. All but right. If I agree uh, okay, with let, her... Let's, let's, let's stop for a minute. A man comes to your door. Okay. And he's got, coming to a very good, very good uh, charity. AIDS. No, no, not that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, he comes from very good char crippled children. Right. All right, fair enough. But he is pushy. Now, you have just decided, a few minutes before he knocked on the door, that you were going to give a hundred bucks to the ch crippled children's fund. And here comes this joker and starts pushing. And start, you know, being uppity and smart alecky and pressuring you. I'm trying to make you feel guilty. How do you react? Do you, how do you react to that? I mean, here you are, going to give. This guy is representing the right cause, but for the wrong reasons. Yeah. See? It's tough, isn't it? Catch-22. So catch-22. But there's a way of dealing with that. If you didn't react to it, there's two ways of doing it. Say, young man, two minutes ago, just before you came in, knocked on my door and started being the smart aleck, See, start correcting. I was just about to give. And now you spoiled it. Hey, what you've done is made me, almost made me not give. You stand corrected. I'll tell you what I'll do. You can, you, I, I, you can leave me right now, and I'm not going to give for the time being. I'm going to find, I'll, I'll send a check, check into the Crippled Children's Fund, Foundation on my own. Thank you very much. Boom. And you, you just, you put him right in his place. You still continue to give. After all, it's a good cause. Why should, why should a smart aleck like that spoil it for, that, for the crippled children's, right? See, so that's how you do it.